Good morning. Today we'll look at our next chapter, which is joint distributions. So, so far we've looked at single random variables by themselves. Now we look at two of them together. We will only consider the discrete case because the continuous case becomes quite difficult. So, here we are. So, first of all, what we'll be looking at in this chapter is the concept of a joint distribution. And then we'll work with joint probability mass functions. So for the discrete distributions, for a single random variable, we have a probability mass function. For two of them, we have a joint probability mass function. We'll take a look at some ideas of expectations and variances in this, in this situation. And the other thing is covariance, where the two of them have some relationship. Uh, we'll take a look at independence, which is a very important aspect. And this is our main focus here, independence. And then we'll take a look at the other aspect, which is sums of random variables. Again, a very important concept we'll see later on in our statistics part. And finally, we'll briefly consider correlation coefficient here, and we'll look at that afterwards in some other context. So, first of all, when you consider random variables, sometimes two things change together. So often the situation is that you have things like, for example, blood pressure and sugar level, now, these are related, but if people have one or both, and uh, problems with either of those. Prey and predator numbers, look at any ecological situation, look at foxes or rabbits. If fox population rises, rabbits decline, and then after a little while, because there aren't enough rabbits to eat, the foxes also decline and, and the rabbits come up again, those kinds of things happen. And then looking at things like percentage of forest cover and rainfall, those two things are also related. So, the joint probability mass functions in these situations can be tabulated. Sometimes they can be, be given formally, but we won't be looking at those situations. They are much more mathematical and we'll stick with the simple situations. So here's an example. We've got a joint probability mass function. We've got random variables x and y. So here the values for x, which is across this way. All right? Those are values for x that way. And these are the values for y here. Now, because the values for y occur here, in the table itself, if I look at the value here, x is equal to negative 1, and y is equal to 0. So this is probability x equals negative 1, and y equals 0. So the comma here means and, essentially. And so we'll write that essentially is the probability mass function for x and y together, and the value is negative 1 and 0. So all the table lists is probabilities. The usual things apply. Probability is always positive, so the probabilities are always positive, or at least more negative, bigger than or equal to zero. And if I add them all up, so the sum of the probabilities over all the values of x and y, if I add them all up, then I should be able to, I should be getting one over here. And so if I add probabilities this way, this is y equals zero. So this probability over here is for y equals 0. You can see I'm listed here probability for y. This is probability y equals 0. And likewise probability y equals 1 and 4. So what I've got over here is just the probability distribution for y. The values are listed here. The probability is over here. So this is what we call the marginal. And the reason is historically because in the margin, so it's called marginal. So it's the marginal, and also the marginal in this case indicates to us that there is something else happening, there's a joint distribution of some kind. Marginal, marginal probability mass function for y. And likewise, the values of x occurs here, so probabilities for x are down here, and this is the marginal probabilities for x. So that's how these things work. All right. Given that I have the marginal probability mass function for y, I can work out things like the mean for y and the mean for x in the usual way. So we'll see how these ideas work afterwards. There's a whole pile of uh, symbols over here, which might make sense to some of you and might make sense to others. I'll leave this. But what I've discussed in the previous slide is the important things over here. 
Here's an example. Parent offspring always share exactly one allele identical by descent. So this is IBD. But siblings can share was zero, one, or two. So what I have listed here in the table is the probability mass function for excuse me, I just like camera for the number of alleles that the siblings may have x and y. So this is sibling one and sibling two, and this is the number of alleles they have, which is x for this and y over there. And here's the probabilities. So if I add the probabilities up, we know that I can find the probability mass function for y on this side. If I add these values up, what I'll get is 0 0.4375. And this is 0 0.375. Oops. Sorry. And this is 0 0.1875. If I add all those up, I should get 1. Across here, this is 0 0.125, 0 0.625 if I add the column, and the last is 0 0.25, and again these will give me 1. So that's the first thing I do, work out the probability mass function as I work through, uh, find the marginals. Now what it asks me here is probability that sibling 1 has more alleles than sibling 2, and the total number of alleles is more than 2. So I look at both of those over here. So A1, sibling 1 has more alleles than sibling 2, essentially it says probability that x is bigger than y more, so it's strictly bigger than. So if I look at this, the places that occurs where x is bigger than y is over here. x is 1, y is 0, x is 2, y is 1, y is 0, and over here x is 2 and y is 1. So those are the only places. So if I add all those up, I'm going to get 0 0.25 plus 0 0.0625 and then plus the 0 0.125. And that comes to 0 0.4375. That's the first part. The second part says the total number of alleles is more than two. Total means adding them, them up. So the places where the sum will be more than two, it says, bigger than two, is going to be, I'll uh, maybe use a different color for that. Let me use a blue. So that's where the sum is bigger than two. Well, it's, actually it says more than two, so I have to be careful. That's not where it's more than two, there's actually is equal to two. So bigger than two will be well, here it's 2 plus 1 is 3, and here it's 2 plus 1 is 3, and here is in the last cell is 2 plus 3 is 4. So those are the places where the sum, I want x plus y to be bigger than 2. So that means I'm adding now 0 0.125 and 0 0.125 again. and 0 0.0625 and that comes to 0 0.3 oops sorry let's fool it around a little bit Zero point three one two five. Okay, so those are those two parts. And the next part says, what is the expected number of alleles for sibling 1? So I'm after here, the expected value of sibling 1 is x, so I'm after e of x. So this is worked out in the usual way. Here, are the pro here is the probability mass function for x. 
And here are the values for x. Something happened there, let me just undo that. Okay, so as I said, there are the probabilities, and here are the probability, the, the values of x. So the, essentially I can, if I wish, I can list here the probability mass function for x separately. So the values it takes are 0, 1, and 2, and the probabilities are 0 0.125 and 0 0.0625 and 0 0.25. So the mean is found in the usual way. So that's going to be 0 times 0 0.125, well that means 0, so I could have ignored that. And then I'm going to get 1 times 0 0.0625 and then finally I'll get 2 times 0 0.25 and that comes to um, 1.125. So this is the expected value. Now, as we know, expected value is a long-term average of some kind, so it won't be exactly an integer in this case, but well, that's what we're finding. So you can see how you can work with joint distribution tables. It's similar, except that it's a two-way table, and the probabilities are listed inside the table. Uh, the usual properties hold. Once I get the marginals, I can work out things as I go through, as, as before. <coughs> so, Lots of space for you to work there. Now, in the last part says, work out e of x times y. So, the way that it works is, if I want e of x times y, what I need to do is, as we saw before, if I'm looking at functions of x and y, so e of x times y means, I look at the whole table, the full lot, and I take a look at every value of x and every value of y, I multiply them, and then multiply with the probability and add them up. So, you can see there are zeros here. So, this would be 0 times 0 times 0 0.125. There's a value of x, a value of y, and the probability 125. And then I go to the next one is 0 times 1 and so on. So you can see where the zeros are, everything will be 0. So essentially there's no contribution from this part and there's no contribution from this part. So all I've got is these four entries to work with. So 0 everywhere else. So all I'll get is a 1 times 1, 1 times 1 and the probability there is 0.25 and then 1 times 2 the probability there is 0 0.125 and then I'm on the next last row over there, so it's 2 times 1 probability is 0 0.125 and then it's 2 times 2 probability is 0 0.625 so if I add all those up, I'm going to get 1 so again, the zeros make it nice because, as I say, to work out e of x times y, I take the value of x, take the value of y, multiply them out, and then multiply with the probability. But the zero means everything will be zero, so the whole column there and the whole row contributes nothing. I've only got these four entries to look at. I take the value of x, multiply it with the value of y together, and the probabilities term by term. So that's how that works. Now, this is an important concept we'll see afterwards because we need for other things. Now, mainly in most tables, we'll see there will be lots of zeros to work with. So most times, there will be not much calculations to do. <coughs> Independence is a new concept over here, but it relates in the same way as we had for the events. So before for events, we said probability of A intersect B should be equal to probability of A times probability of B for independence. Here we're saying probability of X and Y together should be just probabilities of X and just probabilities of Y. In the same way, in other words, we can factorize this or break this up into probabilities just for X and probabilities just for Y. That's how this works. So, 
if I look at some tables over here, here is one. Again, the probabilities for x's will be by adding these. So this will be 0 0.2, and that's 0 0.4, and that we get the 0 0.4. So the whole thing is to 1. And this is 24, this is 0 0.3, and this is 0 0.62. So this will be 0 0.5, the whole thing has to 1. So if I like to take a look at this, what independence means is that every entry in the cell, this one over here, there is the probabilities for x, and this is the probability for y. It should be those to multiply it together. So the 0 0.2 times 0 0.3 is 0 0.06. The same should hold for this next one. There is the marginal there, 0 0.2, and this is 0 0.2. Multiply them together, I get 0 0.04. And the same should hold for every probability. That's 0 0.2, 0 0.4 times 0 0.5, 0 0.2. So you can check that every entry in the table is found by multiplying the corresponding row probability and the corresponding column probability. So that means in this holds the probabilities for x and y together are just probabilities for x times just probabilities for y. So in this case, the x and y are independent. So checking independence means you need to do some more work. You have to check every entry. The more usual case is, of course, if I haven't written independence, in this case, let's look, look at this example. If I add them up, I get 0.4 there for the row sums, and I get 0.15, and this is 2, 3.45, so the whole thing still adds to 1. And here I'm going to get 0.4, that's 0.4 again, and then 0.2. So to show these aren't independent, all I'm going to find is one entry where the probability in the cell isn't equal to the column sum times the row sum. And the simple thing is to pick on the zero. There's a zero over there, and that's not equal to the row sum times the column sum. So that means here the random variables u and v are not independent. Simple to say. So in most cases, we'll be told often if things are independent, or we can work it out by looking at the table. So when we get to data, it's a different situation altogether. We'll be told they're dependent. Here we can see what's going on. So again, what I've just said there, what's going on there. Let's have a quick look at this concept of covariance. But we'll do that in the next lecture. Thank you.